Next up, we have Paul Sells. Hi. Paul, oh, you're behind me. Yeah. OK. Um, of Newport Shipbuilding. Paul is the Quality and Manufacturing Engineering Manager for the X11 Department. Uh, that's quite a title. Uh, for the X11 Department at Newport News Shipbuilding. Um, he has been working with augmented reality applications in defense and manufacturing since 2007. Stage is yours. Thank you. There we go. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Paul Sells. Uh, I have, um, I'm not going to repeat that, that, uh, that enormous title. Um, and basically, my job is to ensure that all of the pieces go in the right places uh, on the world's most complicated product. So I'm, um, I'd like to thank Ori, I guess, for uh, inviting me here to bring the uh, shock and awe portion of uh, this, this week's festivities. But uh, it occurred to me that uh, Dr. Soderstrom's telepresence, sequestration-induced telepresence, uh, was uh, a serious example of how seriously uh, the, the U.S. government is watching expenditures right now. And that's, uh, that was a great, that was an appropriate lead-in uh, for what I'm about to discuss because it's all about reducing acquisition and life cycle costs on one of the largest, uh, most effective components of the U.S. defense arsenal. Uh, you, you guys are maybe in for a treat. This is, um, this is the first time we've been able to discuss this defense research publicly, uh, unless you count flag officers. And I'm not, uh, I'm not used to speaking in rooms with so many cameras, so few, uh, <laughs> so few uniforms and hard hats. Um, so I'd like to thank my partner, Patrick Ryan, for the Herculean effort of getting this uh, cleared for public release. Um, I'll welcome your questions at the end. I like to keep it brief because due to the nature of my work, I'm not uh, able to discuss all, everything. So I'll try to answer them if I'm able. So augmented reality naval applications. What could we do there? Well, we, um, we can we can augment an aircraft carrier. Uh, that's, a, that's a pretty big goal. And I guess I, I would like to talk a little bit about who we are and um, how many people have heard of Newport News Shipbuilding before in this room? That's a lot. Wow. Well, and I'm going to have to talk about how ships are designed and built for a moment because it will provide some context uh, for what, what I'm going to discuss. And I'll do a little live demo and then, um, and then we'll get going. So I work for Huntington Ingalls Industries. We, uh, we design and build uh, the nation's ships. Um, we're uh, actually, we've built over 40%, as you can see, of the, of the Navy's current surface combatant fleet. Um, we have over 100 years of shipbuilding experience. And shipbuilding is a very uh, interesting and niche profession, as I'm sure some of you are wondering, what are shipbuilders doing at an AR conference? But, um, we also work in the oil and gas and nuclear industries and have, um, have some experience there as well. I work for a subsidiary of Huntington Ingalls, which is Newport News Shipbuilding, um, which is where we build nuclear-powered aircraft carriers. And you have all probably seen these products on the news, um, but to give you a little appreciation of exactly how complicated and important this product is, I've been thinking of good analogies, and the best I can come up with is it's a steel skyscraper with the world's busiest airport strapped to the side um, that's going to spend the next 60 years defending the international sea lanes, um, launching aircraft off of railgun catapults that haven't even been, the aircraft haven't even been invented yet. So one of the things that we have to do is we have to survey emerging technologies and see how they'll affect our products as we come, uh, as they come through design and into their life cycle. And we're not uh, notorious for being early adopters, but um, we've seen a lot of promising technologies come and go and believe that AR technologies are actually ready to start solving real world problems and providing real world values. It's not, uh, in our opinion, it's not just for selling soap anymore. Um, so, the USS Gerald R. Ford is a current product we've been working on. It's been in design and construction for over a decade. It, uh, one of the things that we had to pioneer was how to develop an environment where we could engineer and design 
uh, and plan how we were going to build this, this uh, magnificent object uh, before we actually started bending steel into the will of our designers. This, is, uh, this little animation represents uh, what we believe is the world's largest, most comprehensive, single-purpose-built 3D asset. It's what we've designed this aircraft carrier around, and, and it will continue to provide value um, in ways I'm about to discuss for the life cycle of this ship. This guy's going to spend the next 60 years defending, defending the, the sea lanes, and long after I'm gone, uh, hopefully we'll still be using some of the technologies uh, to improve efficiency, but especially mobile technologies and AR technologies um, give us a unique opportunity, I, I think, to explore really new, new ways to, to improve operations and provide value uh, to the U.S. Navy. So this is going to complete, and we're going to see a um, little uh, scary drone launch off at the end. Uh, I don't build drones, but um, I don't build everything that goes on top of that. So this was tens of millions of hours of engineering and design work, and that's almost incomprehensible. That's, that's a national capital asset. Um, it provides us some unique opportunities for advancing AR with everyday use cases on this, um, this floating city with two nuclear uh, power plants. Um, we have every imaginable use case uh, in operation every day. <laughs> but I'm going to give a quick demonstration of something from our uh, research and development labs that um, will illustrate how we think AR technologies can help build, can help uh, our aircraft carriers operate. So, our, our content is modeled, I guess, from the, bulk, the, wolk, eh, the walls to the bulkheads, down to the light switches. Um, it, is, it is truly amazing. Um, but we think it's probably the highest fidelity real world content imaginable right now. It's, it's a real city with metadata attached to every object aboard um, that we're going to show you how we're going to interrogate and operate and, and use. So I'm going to do this quick demonstration. Um, I'd like to thank our forward thinking friends at Daiquiri. This is uh, actually powered with their 4D platform. But, um, Quick switch here. All right. So this is a concept product we we called the Shipboard Augmented Reality Platform, and it uses Every sailor aboard, we know where they are in real time, we know where they're looking, um, we know who they are, and we know what they're looking at. <laughs> um, so I'm going to just do a real quick demonstration of what we call a contextually relevant uh, maintenance evolution. And full disclosure, we're horrible at naming things. We don't even get to name our own products. So um, if anybody has a better idea of what to call that, I'm all ears. I'll load up our application here. So the scenario here is I'm Seema Jones. I'm Seema Jones, and I'm walking along the passageway, and I see, I see uh, something floating in the passageway because I'm using a head-mounted display, uh, and I'm using it every day from entertainment to, uh, to what you're about to see here. Uh, so this is just promoting that something needs to be done because the ship's maintenance uh, system is alerting me that something needs to be done, and it knows that Seaman Jones is qualified to perform that. So in this example, we're going to uh, just do some preventative maintenance on this, this valve. He can accept the task or not accept the task, uh, depending on how much time he has. And just to make sure that this is something he can do, um, or has, maybe he hasn't done it in a while, we're going to walk him through it step by step. Uh, so he's going to remove the bonnet from this this valve, and he's going to get a little notification that he's got to uh, reverse thread direction so he doesn't break it. Um, and then he's going to progress through the steps and, and see exactly what to do next. 
Now, all the, time, all the while he's doing this, he's collecting objective quality information to make sure that it was done correctly. He's just doing it in the background, and he's marking these steps complete in the maintenance uh, system aboard the ship. So he's going to put it back together, and he's going to log it as complete, and he's going to go on to the mess hall and uh, have a great day, and maybe we'll give him some points. just one of many ways that we feel that using augmented reality is going to help us operate, build, maintain, um, and reduce the life cycle and costs for one of the most uh, powerful assets in the, in the United States defense arsenal. Man, that went a lot faster than I thought it would. But um, take any questions? Good morning. Uh, I have a question for you. When you had the, the tracker next to the valve to show the maintenance steps, do you guys have any plans to actually put the 3D over the actual part, or are you going to continue with the side-by-side? -side? You know, we're actually doing looking at which way works better. Uh, we found that some overlay works better in some scenarios, and, and right next to it works better in some scenarios. It, it mostly depends on how accessible the part is. Um, and if you need to get around and kind of interrogate the model versus being able to interrogate the part, you can push it off to the side and kind of look around. So, yeah, that's, that's it. Anyone else? Hey, I think, I think the, uh, the maintenance aspect of AR on shifts in particular is, is a pretty interesting idea. And I think starting with that with the government and, uh, and baby steps is also a good idea. Um, I was wondering if any thoughts been given to AR for more operational applications such as air traffic control or, you know, augmenting from, you know, from the bridge so that, you know, the pilot can view what's going on on deck or maybe situational awareness and reducing some of the display systems that they have on board ships that are just, you know, overly bulky for what they actually do. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And those display systems, um, as I mentioned earlier, I, I, I'm the guy for the ship fitters. All of those display systems require incredibly uh, robust foundations because um, they are attached to something that's going to go into harm's way. So if we can remove as many of those as possible, we'll be able to provide products at a lower price. Um, so yeah, absolutely, that's one of the things that we're, we're looking at. Um, yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, so I was just wondering if you could comment on, you know, given the scale of uh, a carrier, um, what you think are some of the challenges of scaling up uh, what you've done there to, uh, to real life? To real life? Yeah. Um, it, it, yeah, it is a big thing. Well, it, I guess it's our opinion that any sort of disruptive technology is kind of best inserted as a hybrid at first. So you, you go for the low-hanging fruit, and then you build, uh, you build your platform out, and Make sure that it's robust before it transitions into operation, operational requirements, collaborative warfighting, those kind of things. Um, so scaling is uh, something we're pretty good at, actually. So yes, we're thinking about it. Um, and actually being inside a giant Faraday cage presents some, uh, some interesting challenges as well. But it's, it's on our roadmap. Yeah, I was wondering, um, given the... Uh, the number of personnel on a ship like this. I mean, you're going to have thousands and need tens of thousands of headsets. Are, are you looking at an, um, leveraging consumer technology or doing, uh, you know, fit to purpose custom designs for the for shipboard use or some kind of a hybrid model? And also, back to the Faraday uh, cage question: Is um, yeah, how independent do these things need to be to survive? Um, you know, actual use and are you know, roving through long corridors of a Faraday cage and possibly in combat? 
Um, well, again, that's, a, that's very situationally dependent. Um, the personnel that operate on the flight deck, and I can tell you from experience, that was a, what I did in a former life, um, require a different form factor um, than just every day walking around the ship. Um, thanks to a lot of advancements in consumer technology, uh, you know, we're, we're actually absolutely looking at ruggedization and customization, but the price point's becoming so low on some of those that they can almost be considered consumables. Um, so, absolutely, if, uh, if you happen to be a head-mounted display manufacturer, um, this is the first time we've been able to talk about this publicly, so I've um, got some guys who need some units. And when, you're, I mean, when, you're working, when you're working at a scale like that, I mean, it, it is mass production at that point. It's kind of like when you're building a skyscraper, if you want a custom doorknob, you know, it's, it's not custom anymore. If you're ordering 10,000 of them for the building, it becomes a mass production, you know, component. Right. Um, yeah, we, we try to use batch manufacturing um, and as, as much mass, uh, you know, kind of uniform parts as possible uh, for obvious reasons. But it's, we specialize in kind of low, low volume, high variability manufacturing. Everything is custom. So there's challenges for us on the, on the authoring side, on the, uh, on the deployment side. Um, but, but we've got a lot of time to look at all of this. So it's, I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but yeah, I, I, I was just interjecting in the, the, the comment that he or the question that he had about whether you were going with mass-produced, you know, units or whether you were going with custom. And I mean, if you're at 10,000 units, it is mass-produced at that point. It's, it's, you know, right. Yeah, it's more than it's more than just mass-produced. I mean, the, the sailors coming on board are going to be, you know younger and they're going to have experience with consumer products. I recall um, you know, robot control in uh, Afghanistan or um, Iraq where when they had you know, traditional control points, the, the soldiers, controllers. Sol manual controllers for, for teleoperation of, of bomb disposal or bomb detection robots, when they were traditional controllers, people were completely lost in the field and when they handed them an Xbox controller, <coughs> guys could intuitively drive it. And they went from extreme steep learning curves to this is trivial, and yes, I'll use it every day. And I was just wondering if you're, you know, that was kind of behind my question of, are you looking at leveraging consumer off-the-shelf product because, A, as you said, they're disposable price points and you can stock thousands of them on the ship, and B, is people probably know what they are and how to work them without you telling them anything new. So that's, that was what was behind my question. Yeah, um, absolutely. What I didn't mention is we have also looked uh, extensively at AR and mobile technologies and manufacturing, and we've found that um, we don't have to design user interfaces. I mean, the, the, the consumer technology industry is perfecting that at scales we can't compete with. So um, if you hand someone an iPad or, or um, an Android tablet or something, they may have never touched it, but they know how to use it like a pro in five or ten minutes. And um, that, that's, not, that's not a problem I have to solve, which is, uh, which is nice. I'm, I'm a systems engineer, not a... Uh, not a hardware guy, but uh, yeah, our strategy is kind of to follow the consumer market and then adapt and ruggedize as, as necessary. But we couldn't have done this 10 years ago, um, not, at, not at prices that would make, make sense. Any other questions? This is probably a bit more of a, a business decision. How is it that you guys justify the additional expense to your tech dot process or to the whole system in order to justify what is ultimately, I guess, an efficiency call? Um, what, what are some, some of the thought processes that kind of went through this whole thinking about why AR did make sense, that uh, whether you can approach the government, I guess, in this case, to finance this sort of a project? Right, well, actually, we financed this all internally. Um, so. This it was not, not yet financed by the government, so we just strongly believe that we have been able to build use cases, build examples, and uh, complete pilots that have convinced us that the business case makes sense. Yeah, anyone else? Any other questions? All right, thanks. Great. My name is Paul Sells, and uh, my team and my friends and I, Augment Aircraft Carriers. Thanks. <laughs>